This 117th Congress, the American people chose an evenly split Senate. It gives me great pride to serve as Speaker of the most diverse House of Representatives in the history of our country. Welcome to the Washington Post Live. I'm Jacqueline Alamany. My guest today is Senator Mike Rounds of South Dakota. As the top Republican on the Senate Armed Services Committee on Cybersecurity, Rounds has taken a hard line against the foreign ransomware attacks against the U.S. And as the former governor of South Dakota, Rounds remains committed in his fight for cattlemen, consumers, and Native Americans. He's also one of the 21 senators working on a very tight deadline to get a bipartisan infrastructure plan done. Welcome, Senator Mike Rounds. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, good morning. Appreciate the opportunity to visit. Let's start with the meatpacking industry and, and the cattle market. Uh, you know, meatpacking and cattle farmers are in a crisis right now, as you've repeatedly noted. Today, the Senate Agriculture Committee is holding the first hearing on the cattle market, which you've called a monopoly. Can you explain the current situation for our viewers? Sure. Since about 1920, over 100 years ago, there's been antitrust laws that have been in place. And the idea is to make sure that we have fair competition in the marketplace. Back then, there were basically four major packers that had about 50% of the entire market. Today, 100 years later, four packers have a well well in excess of 80% of the market when it comes to processing beef. What that means to consumers is that these major beef processors will then price it to your, to your market, to your grocery, to your supermarket, but the price that you pay at the grocery, at the, at the, at the supermarket level, can be significantly different than what a cow-calf operator or a feeder, the people that actually produce the beef, get paid when uh, they go to bring their livestock to market. When you don't have competition, or if the competition basically understands what the other three competitors do, it makes for unfair trade opportunities for those, those cattle producers. These cattle producers are barely making enough to even pay for their inputs. And so right now we're at a crisis. At the same time, these major packers have had a very difficult time trying to process a lot of the beef here in the United States because of COVID-19 and the restrictions that have been placed on them. They couldn't get PPE for a while. Uh, there were illnesses that went through. They had to shut down some facilities and so forth. So as you have a very concentrated number of packers, the, the demand stayed up for the beef, but at the same time, they had a difficult time trying to move that much beef through limited processing facilities. It identified how serious our food security issues were in the United States because of the concentration within the packing industry. And, and you've introduced two pieces of legislation to address some of these problems that you just mentioned, um, one of them being uh, the Meatpacking Special Investigator Act, which would create an office of the Special Investigator for Competition Matters dedicated to preventing and addressing anti-competitive practices in the meat and poultry industries uh, and enforcing our nation's antitrust laws. Why do, you, is, why do you think more government oversight is necessary in this case? And in this case, the government oversight has already been identified. It's already been directed, but they don't have the tools in order to follow through to actually do their job. Uh, this is a bill that Senator Grassley and Senator Tester are both on. It's bipartisan in nature. And our goal is just to get the tools available to the Department of Agriculture in conjunction with the Department of Justice to be able to enforce and investigate antitrust violations. That literally, that tool does not exist appropriately today. And you had also introduced legislation aimed at creating more competition with the meatpacking industry. Do you think that this is a national security concern with regards to our food supply? I do. Uh, I think the pandemic accelerated the concern among consumer groups. Uh, let me give you just a couple of examples. Today in the United States, with the concentration in the packing industry, uh, if you lose a single packer, if you lose, if you have a fire at one plant, you can lose 5% of your packing capability, which then slows down or decreases the value of the animals that need to be, be harvested. And at the same time, it dramatically increases the price at the grocery store. In this particular case with the pandemic, when they had to shut down because of the COVID-19, 
we saw significant spikes for consumers in the grocery store. But something else also happened. The beef coming into the United States, boxed beef, could be re re repackaged under existing Department of Ag rules and sold with a voluntary label of product of the USA on it. Now think about that a little bit. You want to talk about false advertising. You can bring boxed beef, that's frozen beef, brought into the United States from other countries. And if you repackage it, you get to put a product of the USA label on it. I think consumers deserve to know where their beef is actually coming from. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that's part of the issue. The other part of it is, is you take a look at what you're paying in a grocery store for hamburger or for beef uh, products. And then you take a look at how that compares with what a, a, a producer, a cow-calf operator or a feeder gets paid for the animal when it's delivered to a, a, uh, a processing facility, a packer. The difference can be almost $1,000 a head per animal profits or uh, a profit split between what they're paying for the animal versus what they're getting for the box beef at the end of the, the cycle. The other piece on this that we're trying to get is, is we want smaller processors to be able to compete by selling their products across state lines. The state licensed processors right now have to meet all the same federal guidelines, but they're restricted to selling only within their own state. They can sell 400 miles across the state, but they can't sell 50 miles across the state line. That doesn't make sense. And we think some of those meat processors should be able to expand and grow and compete perhaps, or at least add more smaller processors uh, to compete with the beef processors that really control the market today. And how do you think is the best way to go about doing that exactly? I know you sent a letter to Attorney General Merrick Garland uh, about the industry violating antitrust laws. Do you think that these companies need to be broken up similar to the way, uh, you know, Bell Telephone was broken up? It's one possibility. We've actually sent three letters to the Attorney General. Uh, we started with four of us last March. About uh, three weeks later, we sent a similar letter with almost 20. We've got 26 members that have signed a letter to uh, Attorney General Merrick Garland. We didn't want to have an investigation get lost in the change from one administration to another. And uh, when I visited with Merrick Garland, when, he, when his nomination was up before the Senate, and, and I wanted to visit with him uh, uh, about his role as Attorney General uh, with regard to, to investigating monopolies and so forth, uh, we made it clear that we just didn't want this to be dropped. And two things. First of all, if there were violations of antitrust, we wanted to have them pursued, which meant you had to do the investigations or continue the investigations that were already going on. Second of all, if they weren't violating antitrust laws, then we've got some major problems with the legislation that's on the books today. And we wanted to be able to look at what we had to do to reinvigorate those because clearly it's not working fairly for the producers and also the consumers are paying an inordinately high price at the uh, supermarket, which reduces demand for our producers. That was going to be my, my next question about how this impacts what we pay when we actually go to the grocery store. Um, but I think what's a little confounding is you walk, you know, I, I think that would what would be helpful is if you could walk us through that why the price of cattle is low, but the price at the grocery store still remains high. Sure. We, we have, let's just call it a choke point. Uh, you have produce or you have producers that are ready to sell their cattle, but cattle, when they mature, they have to be harvested within a certain amount of time. Um, it, it's not like just simply putting a commodity back on the shelf like a canned good. Uh, they get bigger and the bigger they get, the less desirable they get because they have more fat on them, just as an example. But it also takes longer to process. So when, uh, when a producer is feeding livestock, they want to sell them between certain weights to, to make the best type of meat. Let's just say between 1,100 and 1,200 pounds as an example. When it gets there, if, if the processing capabilities are not good enough to handle all of the livestock that are ready to be processed at that time, then they pay a lower price because there's a glut on the market of the livestock compared to the amount of processing capability. But if your processing capability has been reduced because of COVID-19 issues or because you have a fire at a plant or whatever, then that means that it may not meet the demand at the grocery store and the price then goes up because supply is not meeting demand. That's what's going on right now. You have a choke point 
among the four major processors. There was a fire last year in one plant, just as an example. COVID-19 slowed down their capacity. One of the producers told me, or one of the uh, major packers told me that in some cases they were only operating at about 70% capacity. And that's slowing down the amount of beef that's being made available to be put into a grocery store. And if there's less meat there, but you still have high demand this time of the year, people know how good beef is. They look forward to steaks in the summertime. If there's more demand than what supply is, price goes up. So consumers are paying a higher price, but the price is not being reflected back for what they're paying a, a producer for their livestock because their choke point is, is they can't handle more beef right now at this time. And lastly, on this topic, uh, you know, with regards to the coronavirus pandemic uh, and the struggles cattle farmers faced during the pandemic, um, earlier this year, the USDA had pledged to continue food assistance program payments to provide aid to the industry. Has the pandemic hurt ranchers and the meat industry as a whole? And, and what do they still need moving forward? Yeah, there, the, the, there was an impact because in a lot of cases, the price for some commodities actually went down and they literally couldn't get their beef to market and so forth. So we did build into the pandemic relief, the bipartisan pandemic relief bills, money to make available for producers who had lost money on the sale of their commodities during that time period. There were a couple of different proposals over a period of about a year that did help, didn't make up the entire loss. The bigger issue right now, what most producers want is just a fair price for the product that they're trying to put onto the market. The other item that impounds all this is, is that we lost our mandatory country of origin of labeling, or the mandatory, they call it MCO, a mandatory country of origin of labeling that we did have in effect for a period of time where we could identify the beef that was being produced in the United States versus beef that was being produced or brought in from overseas. We really do think we've got the best beef in the world. Um, and, and we're proud to be able to put our label on it. But at this stage of the game, um, our laws in our country uh, do not demand that we put that into our trade agreements. And so the World Trade Organization stopped us from putting a, a mandatory country of origin labeling guideline in effect. Thus, you don't know where your beef is coming from today unless a voluntary label is put on it. Unfortunately, the voluntary label that consumers look at uh, in a grocery store, will look at beef and say, gee, it's a product of the USA, but it may very well have just been frozen, brought into the country, repackaged. And unfortunately, since 2003, those rules have allowed that corn beef to be labeled as American beef, product of the USA. And Senator, it's really a, a fascinating topic. Um, I, I thank you for your work on that. I want to move on to cyber and ransomware attacks as the top Republican on the Armed Services Cyber Security Subcommittee. You've taken a hard line against foreign cyber attacks, including the Colonial Pipeline hack. Uh, why do you think it took a ransomware crisis involving JBS for this issue to get more attention nationally? I think because it directly impacted consumers. It impacted what we took for granted. Um, first of all, it, it, with regard to the pipeline, uh, there's a whole lot of consumers out there that got impacted because criminals that are in other countries were able to come back in and make a demand and actually short us the our needed supplies. Same thing happened with JBS and the ransomware that was imposed on them. Here's what we've really got going on. I, I, I look back and I say, you know, our, our country actually formed the United States Marine Corps. When we went in and we found pirates that were in other countries back in the early 1800s, and uh, they were taking on shipping that was impacting our ability to trade with other countries. We sent the Marines in. Uh, they went after pirates who were living in other countries. They had safe harbor in other countries. They took them out and they sent a message to the world saying, we don't care where you're at. If you're impacting free trade, if you're impacting the trade for our consumers in the United States of America, we're going to stop it and, and we're going to find you. Well, today we have pirates. They're, they're cyber pirates. They're cyber criminals. They live in other countries. They have safe harbor in other countries. They use lots of different tools. But what they will do is, is come in with a ransomware. They'll find a way to get in because of either bad hygiene at the country, company, where people will look at phishing emails or so forth. The, these criminals will take a little bit of time, find their way into a system, put in software that has bugs in it that can control or manipulate that system. 
And then they'll go to the owners of the company and simply say, look, if you want your systems to operate, if you want to be able to move your products, you know, your, your produce around or whatever, or if you want to be able to con continue to be able to do business, you're going to have to pay us a, a, you know, a, a fee, a ransom. But in this case, they're using a digital currency, um, and the digital currency makes it a little bit easier for them to, to be able to take that money in many cases without being traced. In this particular case, they got caught. They did some stupid things. And they got caught, and that ransomware money was returned in one case. But I think that we have to still take on the, the position that if, if, uh, uh, if you've got these cyber pirates out there, if you've got these criminals that are in other countries, once we find them, we want to be able to go out and reach out and basically touch them and make it extremely difficult for them to do business or to be able to impact people in the United States again. You do have some silos here in the United States. First of all, the Department of Defense does not actively engaged inside of our country. We don't want that to happen. We want our military to engage outside of our country or to protect against incoming attacks. We have the Department of Justice and the FBI and so forth, Homeland Security that actually work within our country. Those agencies all have to work together in a coordinated fashion in order to use the offensive tools that are found within our, our, our Department of Defense uh, to be able to go on out and find the individual specifically and take them on. So it's a coordinated effort that has to occur. And Senator, I wanna ask you about the topic of discussion and attention on Capitol Hill yesterday. Um, you were one of uh, you know, the lawmakers uh, who voted against the For the People, the voting, the sweeping Voting Rights Act introduced by Democrats yesterday. You and really the entire Republican caucus, were you disappointed that Senator Joe Manchin ultimately voted um, in favor of proceeding with the um, move to debate the Voting Rights Act on the Senate floor? No, look, it, it, it was going to take 60 votes to get on the bill to begin with. In other words, in order to debate a bill in the United States Senate, it takes 60 votes to agree to start debate. What Senator Manchin wanted to do was to send a message saying, look, I've got some things. I know this bill isn't perfect. And he wanted to offer his amendments to it. So he said, I want to get on. I want to debate the bill. And I want to offer my amendments to the bill. Um, most of us on the Republican side have the same opinion about the bill. We think it was a major encouragement. By the federal government into voting rights that normally are handled by the states. Uh, we didn't like the idea that they had changed the Federal Election Commission from a bipartisan uh, 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 number to a partisan number that would have been controlled by one party or the other all the time. We thought that was a major mistake. We didn't like the idea that the federal government was now going to take on the role of matching small donations to the tune of six to one so that taxpayers would be funding multiple federal elections at the same time, and that money comes from taxpayers who may or may, may not agree with the, all of the different candidates that are on the ballot. We also didn't like the idea that they were basically going to take away a lot of the current identification requirements for voters at the, at the polls. The vast majority of Americans say, if you're going to vote, you should be able to show your ID. And the states have required that. This would have dramatically relaxed those rules. We just didn't simply think that that was the right thing to do. We also thought the fact that they were, that the claim for the reason why this bill was because of legislation that's in a lot of states right now that is a, a basic look at either expanding or retracting or changing the guidelines under which people cast their votes. But this bill came around long before the pandemic and long before this last election. Well, most of what was in this bill was put together way back in 2019. So for most of us, we've looked at it. We simply disagree that the federal government should be that directly involved in monitoring uh, and directing the states as to how they do their electoral processes. And, and Senator Manchin did address some of the concerns that you just mentioned, uh, especially specifically the voter ID. He um, in his compromise memo, he did outline potentially including uh, the requirement to provide a driver's license in order to be able to vote. Uh, if, if everything that you just mentioned was potentially removed from a bill, is that something that you could get behind or is a federal voting rights bill just a non-starter for you, generally speaking? You know, we've had federal attempts at, at uh, voter rights in the past, and it doesn't mean that it's impossible or that it's never going to be something that we talked about in the future. 
But a lot of what Senator Manchin tried to do was moving in the right direction. But it didn't take care of some of the concerns that we had with regard to the FEC, the Federal Election Commission. We were still concerned with the federal funding of, of the different uh, 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 items. We still had uh, concerns about, like with Joe, what he wanted to do was with regard to determining legislative districts and so forth, he really kind of hoped to have a computerized system that was run by the federal government that would actually make uh, state decisions about how state legislative races would be laid out or congressional districts would be laid out. I really do like the way that the states have laid out in the past, and there is no such thing as a perfect process for redistricting, but we go through it every single year and the courts do get involved right now. In South Dakota, we've had voting rights challenges in the past. Sometimes we're successful in moving them through without having uh, Department of Justice interaction. Sometimes the Department of Justice gets involved and they make modifications to it. I like that system. I, I think it's. A, I think a lot of the guidance on on voter registration and the and the split among the the redistricting and so forth uh, is one that's healthy to have a debate on every ten years. Uh, it's not perfect, but I'd much rather have it be done on a state by state basis rather than having the federal government step in trying to direct the states to do that work that they've done uh, since the beginning of the country. And on, on the topic of voting, even at a, at a local level, a state by state basis, are you in favor of more people being able to vote, expanding the right to vote for constituents? I like the idea of keeping it at age 18. I didn't like the idea in this particular bill that would have changed the voting age to 16. I don't like the idea that felons automatically have the opportunity to vote again, uh, which was included in this bill. So with regard to that, I would have had concerns about both of those two issues on it. I do want to see those individuals that are over the age of 65 or over the age of 18 all be able to readily vote. And I, I like the idea of early voting. In South Dakota, we've been very successful on, on, on open voting. We've had it for years, but we've done something else. Um, we don't send out ballots in the mail uh, to everybody. We send out request forms so that individual voters can actually request a ballot, but that way it's a verified that the voter is registered to vote to begin with. Um, and that's worked very well for us. We've got one of the highest voter turnouts in, in, in the country. Uh, but we also have expanded it to, to where we can start voting fairly early in the process, more than 14 days or 15 days in advance. So I don't have an objection to early voting, but I do also want a specific cutoff time to when ballots need to be in. And, uh, and I think that's important as well. And I didn't quite like the way that the earlier uh, uh, demands were that ballots had to be counted over an extended period of time after the polls actually closed. And I want to ask you about a process consuming a, a big chunk of your time right now, um, the infrastructure bill. You're part of the group of 21, a bipartisan group of senators who are currently supporting a $794 billion five-year bipartisan infrastructure package. How realistic do you think it is that this compromise is going to get enough bipartisan support and ultimately uh, be, be pushed through and signed into law? Both Republicans and Democrats want to do an infrastructure bill. Uh, we all agree that it's time. We agree that infrastructure should definitely include the roads, the bridges, the ports, airports. I think there's strong support for 5G implementation. I think uh, uh, the, the hardening of our electrical system and the expansion of our electrical system as transportation needs change is going to be a critical part of infrastructure in the future. All of those items, I think, tend to, to push towards a bipartisan agreement. I think in the Republican uh, conference, I think I see strong support, not unanimous support, but very, very strong support for a bipartisan deal on an infrastructure bill. I think Democrats feel the same way. The challenge right now is to get to uh, somewhere between one and $1.2 trillion on an infrastructure bill over somewhere between five and eight years is I think where it's really gonna end up. Um, I think the pay fors are a challenge. Uh, Republicans traditionally have wanted some sort of a, uh, of a user fee included for making payments. And I don't think that there will be a problem on, on water projects or on utility projects where you have, you know, uh, rates that are included for consumers to help pay back on it for the benefits they receive for water and for electricity and so forth. 
think where the challenge is going to be on roads uh, and bridges, it, is it time to, um, to look at what kind of a fee we put on for electric vehicles for using the roads? And, and, and what should we do with the gas tax itself? What's a reasonable approach? Should we index it so that as inflation goes up and the price of fuel goes up, should we actually automatically increase the, uh, the price per gallon as well? In the past, we've been hesitant to do that. I think we're. I think the president right now is rather hesitant to do that as well. So part of the deal there is going to be: Do you just simply put a couple pennies more on the gas tax as a as a as a user fee? I think the president's kind of uh, he doesn't like that idea as near as I can tell right now. So we want to respect the fact that the administration has to play a role in this. But yeah, I, look, I I'm pretty optimistic that we can come up with a package on infrastructure. I think there will be a discussion on the part of some of our more liberal colleagues trying to add items in that really aren't infrastructure, but that if we don't agree on it that way, they'll probably, probably try to put some additional items into a separate bill that would be a reconciliation bill that they could do with just 51 votes on the floor of the Senate. So I, and I think they're gonna try to negotiate that within the, the Democrat party uh, within the conference themselves to see if they can get in a, an agreement on that before they move forward with infrastructure. Uh, Republicans, I think, today would say that they're ready to move forward with an infrastructure package and find a path and make the appropriate negotiations to get it done. I'm not sure my Democrat colleagues are that far along because I think uh, they're gonna want to be assured that there is a, a, a separate agreement among their entire conference on a reconciliation package that would spend a lot more money on the items that would not be coverable under a true infrastructure package. That may very well be a bigger challenge for them than actually coming to a consensus on an infrastructure bill with Republicans. And I believe you all are meeting with the White House again today to try to narrow down talks and, and come to some sort of compromise. What exactly is on the agenda? Um, is it the pay fors that you're all still trying to, to negotiate on? I, I think right now what we have is a basic framework. And I think you're going to find modifications in all of the items. The size of the package itself is still up for debate. What's included in terms of infrastructure is a debate, but the pay fors are going to be is still going to be a part of the negotiations. Um, whether or not the new money or the borrowed money is of the appropriate right proportion, that, that that's all a part of this. But once it starts coming together, I think it could move fairly rapidly because people look at it and say either look it's worth it or it's not worth it, and pretty easy to count the votes at. And if Democrats do ultimately push uh, through a another bill that, that they're simultaneously tracking through budget reconciliation, um, and also perhaps decide to eliminate the filibuster in order to get some more Democratic priorities done, what sort of, of consequences do you think that's going to have um, for the party? It will change uh, the United States Senate forever. It will change how Congress works forever. It will change the relationship between the states and the federal government forever. Uh, the idea that the founding fathers had to begin with was that the United States Senate would work on a consensus basis. Uh, the Senate would be an ongoing body that would be very slow to react, and it would act the cooling part of the legislative body. They wanted the Senate to, to take the emotions that you find in the House uh, and to chill it a little bit and to, and, and to really thoughtfully go through and to not make knee-jerk decisions that ultimately might be, be uh, uh, not the right decisions. I think the Founding Fathers had it right. Um, they want the Senate to be difficult to get things through. They didn't want the federal government directly involved in the lives of everyday Americans every single day. They truly believed in federalism. They wanted the vast majority of the laws and rules to be made at the local level. They wanted the federal government to provide for the common defense and for free interstate trade and to make it easy for interstate trade to go on. But they didn't want the federal government making all of the rules and simply overriding what the states were doing. That's the reason why the Senate was designed to make it more difficult. And remember, when founding fathers put this all together to begin with, the Senate, for the most part, was uh, made up of members who were selected by state legislative bodies to come in and to represent the states, the states' rights 
in negotiations with the federal government and the House of Representatives who were elected by the people. So it was always designed to be a case to where the Senate was going to be the slow-moving body. And once you go to a 51-vote margin in the United States Senate, and I hope it does not happen. We rejected it when we were in control. And uh, I, I hope the, the Democrat colleagues that, that I've talked to will stick to their guns and not eliminate the filibuster. Long term, I think it's better for the country if we continue to work hard and do that frustrating thing of trying to find a consensus before we pass federal law. Uh, before we have to wrap quickly, Senator, uh, I do want to note that Mitch McConnell did eliminate the filibuster uh, in, in 2009. Do you think he fundamentally changed the Senate? No, Mitch, M Mitch McConnell did not eliminate the filibuster in 2009. What did happen was Harry Reid changed the filibuster with regard to what had always by tradition been a 51 vote uh, agreement on judges. But uh, in, in the early 2000s, the Senate kind of changed, and they didn't filibuster judges then. They would negotiate through. Judges coming in that were within a state were never put in unless they had the blue slips or the agreement from both members in the, in the, uh, in the Senate for that particular state. Um, if it was a district judge or a circuit court judge, they would negotiate back and, and, uh, and look at whether or not they needed everybody's blue slip in that district. But, uh, but Harry Reid changed with a nuclear option the, uh, the issue with regard to judges and said, we're only going to need 51 votes to get on for judges. Mitch McConnell said, if you do that, you will rue the day. And when Republicans are back in, they'll put judges in with 51 votes because that is now the Senate rule. What Mitch did do was to expand it to say, just as Democrats would have done, was to say, if it's a Supreme Court nominee, we're going to take the same approach with 51 votes as opposed to 60 votes to get on a Supreme Court nominee. So today, your judges are not filibusterable. Their, their 51 votes determines whether or not a judge is accepted once they've been nominated by the president. But Mitch McConnell did not break the filibuster. Harry Reid did with the nuclear option. And that would be the same position that if, if, if uh, the Senate leader de to die, decided today to break the 60-vote the, the, the margin on legislation, they would be doing it by using what we call the nuclear option, where when the ruling of the chair is that it takes 60 votes to proceed, they would challenge it and say, I disagree with the ruling of the chair. And if they disagree and say, I think it's only going to be 51, even though it's written in the law that's, or in the rules that say it's 60, that's called the nuclear option, and that's the way that they would break it. At that point, then, it becomes a majority vote only in the Senate for everything. Senator, unfortunately, we are out of time today, but thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you today. And at 1130 this morning, women trailblazers in technology are coming on Post Live. And at 3.30 p.m., Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez will be joining us. Thanks so much, and we'll see you all later.